Good morning, everyone. So thank you for being here for the session on demystifying biometric approach, the experts call. And we have a lot of eminent speakers for this session. And to begin with, we have Dr. Arup Chakravarti. He requires no introduction. And uh, over to you, sir. It's, it's all right, it's all right, yeah. So, <clears throat> a, a very good morning, friends. Thanks, uh, KSOS, for uh, having me here. Thank you, Shaji, for including me in your instruction course. Shaji is an up-and-coming and a very dynamic, very brilliant, you know, member of KSOS, who has been doing exceptionally good work for <coughs> KSOS at all fronts. So, I'll be... <coughs> can the timer be switched on? So... Yeah. So I'll be talking about uh, commonly ignored issues in IL power calculation. So we all know it is cliche to say that cataract surgery today is like refractive surgery and we want to hit the bullseye each and every time we take up a patient for cataract surgery. And uh, for uh, most of the cases, the holy grail is Plano 66, though it could be any other target refraction. Now we need to have a benchmark, what we are aiming for in our practice. So this is actually a very comprehensive study published uh, uh, by Giacomo Savini, a good friend of mine from Italy. So it showed that with all the major formulas, current formulas, you know, we should have 88% uh, of your patient with Barrett Universal 2 to EVO 90.67% of your post-op refraction falling within a refractive prediction error of 0.5 diopter. So this is the direction that we want to move at. Beyond, this is our routine cases. I'm not talking about complex scenarios, which will be dealt with by you know, the subsequent speakers. And this is where we want to go. And uh, maybe beyond that, it may not be very easy for us to you know, further improve or fine tune the results. So basically what I'd like to emphasize for the youngsters here, you know, IL part calculation, most of the time, we, it is something that, you know, preoperatively we just tick the box. Yeah, it has been done, over, no. It, it encompasses the entire gamut of the surgical experience of the patient, spanning from the preoperative uh, stage to the postoperative period. Now, uh, we have already known that ocular surface plays a very important role in IL part calculation, and it has to be stabilized in case it is unstable, and uh, if, uh, the, if you do the biometric measurements on an unstable cornea on a, with an ocular surface disease, it's quite possible that your keratometry reading will not be properly done. And as a result, even in your monofocal cases, you may end up, land up with a, tar with a tar residual refractive error. And for torticare surgery, you may end up you know, calculating the wrong axis and the wrong power. So uh, the first thing first is, you know, we always, for all cataract patients, rule out the presence of ocular surface disease. A diagnostic workup is done. And in case we have uh, found that the ocular surface is deficient, the patient is put on, on tear substitutes to optimize the ocular surface. And the biometry is repeated every few weeks until we get two consecutive repeatable values. And you know, I would like to emphasize on the nil touch technique of biometry. When you do the biometry, the cornea should be pristine. It should be virgin. It should not be done when you know we have put dilating drops on the patient's eye, anesthetic drops on the patient's eye, or you know, Goldman application antonometry, gonioscopy has been done. Sometimes we end up doing it because of logistics reasons. You know, but in such cases, the, it has to be explained to the patient that you know that could be uh, we could miss, miss the target refraction, and it is always in, important to bring the patient back on another day for the biometric work. Up. Many a time, right from my postgraduate days, I have realized that you, know, you need to dilate certain eyes for uh, a better biometry. I'm talking about ultrasound bio biometry, and this also holds true for optical biometry. Now, recently there was a study 
uh, this was using the Ironmaster 700. It showed that 8.5%, 5.2% of cataract patients had very low quality biometric measurements because the cataract was dense. And once those cases were dilated, uh, you know, in almost 76% of the patients, the biometric values improved. So there is some you know, role for pupil dilatation in case you are not getting proper biometric measurements, even in the optical biometer. But then this brings, back, brings us back to another experience of ours. That is, you know, uh, if you do the biometric measurements after pupil is dilated, the measurements are altered. You know, you, may, you get wrong parameters. You get different parameters. Central corneal thickness, anterior chamber depth, lens thickness, everything changes. And it has been shown that, you know, if, if, even if you use the latest formulas, Barrett Universal 2, Olsen, Hill RBF, Hygis, you know, almost one-fourth of the time, you end up with a myopic result in post-operative period. So this has to be discussed with the patient when you take the consent from the patient. Sometimes we use tear substitutes before biometry. So in case you do that, please wait for at least five minutes before you do the keratometry for those patients. And again, you know, this is a meta-analysis, a slide given to me by the late uh, Dr. Richard, Dr. Hygis, you know. So it shows that, you know, optical biometry is way superior even for, you know, for, uh, uh, for, uh, for ultrasonic biometry using the immersion mode. Uh, even if you are using a optical biometer, please uh, remember that the validation guidelines still work. If you get results uh, which are tagged red, you know you may have to delete those results and repeat the findings, repeat the measurements. In the for hard cataract situations, some of these older bi optical biometers do not give any value. So this is what I do: right eye, left eye. So left eye, I could use the optical biometry got a value. Ultrasonic biometry was done for both eyes. And then I look for the concordance of the optical biometry value and ultrasonic biometry value in, in the left eye, or, if, or sometimes if it's a pseudophagic eye. And if they're more or less similar, you know, I know that biometric uh, evaluation has been done properly, and it is uh, again confirmed by repeat tests. There are a lot of new formulas available. Many of these formulas do extremely well. My go-to formula is actually the Barrett Universal 2 formula. Uh, uh, Barrett suite actually takes care of all your IL requirements. So I would recommend that you use, start using this suite. It can even used even if you have done an opt contact biometry for ultrasonic biometry. And ASRS.org, this particular homepage gives you a lot of options. Can formula is the new kid in the block, so it gives better results for toric IELTS, for keratoconic IELTS, and there are a lot of studies. And for high uh, range, you know, extremes of uh, eyes, uh, small axial length, large axial length, I use uh, multiple formulas and then take a decision appropriately. So friends, uh, please remember that, please remember that, you know, uh, before I forget, you know, I mean, you can always make use of the second eye values for, to fine tune the results in the right eye. And uh, uh, preoperative measurements should be done on the knife cornea. Use validated measurements, so work with properly optimized lens constants. Apply, adapt to new technologies as they present. All new technologies are not the best, that is to be remembered. Employ, employ the right formula and strive to use all available resources to their best advantage. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, any clarifications or any doubts in the first presentation? Uh, Others, thank okay. you. Thanks a lot for your patient hearing. You, thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. So the next speaker would be uh, Dr. Anand Balasubramanian. He will be uh, giving enlightening us on the topic Angle Alpha and Kappa, their relevance in cataract surgery. Dr. Anand, he is, uh, is a cornea refractive fellowship in Sh Shankara Eye Hospital under Dr. J.K. Reddy. He is currently consultant cornea, cataract and refractive services at Shankara Eye Hospital, Bangalore. His areas of interest are phakic IOLs, keratoconus and lamellar corneal procedures. Over to you, Dr. Anand. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saji, for in including me in this uh, symposium. The topic for me is relevance of angle alpha and angle kappa and cataract surgery. 
Now, as you all know, spectacular vision after surgery has become achievable, and that is because of careful patient selection and the identification of factors which characterized a good multifocal candidate. Now, aside from the uh, aside from the conventional biometric parameters like axial length, keratometry, and anterior chamber depth, additional anatomical variables should be considered in the, as an inclusion criteria for preoperative assessment and surgical planning. Now, human eye has three uh, has certain axes which are subtended by angles: the optical uh, axis, the visual axis, and the pupillary axis. Now, the optical axis is the line which passes through the center of the cornea with limbus as the reference. The visual axis is a line joining the fixation point, and the pupillary axis is the line uh, uh, intersecting the center of the pupil with the pupil as the reference. Now, angle alpha is the angle which is formed between the optical axis and the visual axis, and it is by the mnemonic OVA, whereas the angle kappa is the angle formed between the pupillary axis and the visual axis, and it can be remembered as PVK. Now, this is just a photograph showing you all the three reference points, and this is mostly uh, measured either in millimeters or angle, and uh, among the two, the millimeters what is routinely followed. Now this is another photograph showing the same thing and it is, uh, it is uh, suffice, suffice to say that the angle alpha is what is actually should be used for the cataract surgery IOL centration whereas the angle kappa should be used for a keratorefractive procedure. But among the two it is very difficult to measure the angle alpha so angle kappa is what is, is commonly used. Now the normal angle kappa is slightly positive, that's because the fovea is slightly temporal to the pupillary axis and the normal angle is between 3 to 5 degrees and there is no gender correlation, it decreases with age. The angle alpha on the other hand is around 5 degrees on average, it is larger in hyperopes as compared to the myopes and in the study they have shown that it's around, in the normal population is anywhere between 0.3.5 to 0.4 millimeters and in another study by Wang they concluded among the two the angle alpha is a better predictor for the photic phenomenon and patient satisfaction following the implantation of multifocal IOLs. Now what is the significance? Now the multifocals are known to be sensitive to the tilt and degeneration and even a slight decentration can affect the eye optical performance decreasing the optical quality and one of the reasons is in patients who have very large angle alpha or angle kappa. Now in this study where they looked at influence of angle alpha and angle kappa on the visual outcome following implantation of a trifocal lens, it was clearly seen that the al al angle kappa is not a positive predictor, but angle alpha is what is required as a preoperative screening tool to implant uh, before we implant these multifocal IOLs. And this is also another study which tried to prove the same thing. Now, good centration of premium IOLs is critical for successive out uh, successful outcomes. If a diffractive IOL is uh, decentered in relation to the visual axis, the patient may look through the diffractive rings and not through the central optical zone, thereby deteriorating the post-op visual function and the increase of the hydroid aberration. Now, this was an, a study where they looked at angle uh, influence of angle alpha on the visual quality uh, before implanting uh, uh, extended depth of focal lens, and it was clearly seen in up to four po up to 0.4 millimeters. There was no much of a problem in the visual quality, but in patients who had a larger uh, 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 angle of more than 0.4 millimeters, they said that it led to more of occurrence of the halos and the glare and the photic phenomenon, and hence these patients should not be considered for multifocals. And how do we measure it? There are different ways in which we measure it. The synaptophore, then the tomogromic devices, the optical biometers, the autorefractive meter, and the eye trace. Among this, the synaptophore is the most accurate, but it's not commercially available. And what we normally use is the eye trace, avirometer, and the tomographic devices. Now, this is just a photo showing you the color-coded uh, the eye trace abrometer is commonly used and anything in red which is more than 0.5 millimeters is a strict no-no for implantation of multifocal lenses. And this was a comparison where they looked at all the different uh, gadgets that are available to measure the angle kappa and they saw that all were, uh, all were uh, repeatable but the best results were, was to have it, it was there when they used the pentacam and the lens star. Now to conclude, if the, visual, if the patient's visual axis and the limbal center are not properly, uh, not properly aligned, it is better to avoid a multifocal lens. In patients who have very uh, high angle kappa, you can slightly decenter the IOL nasally to keep it on the visual axis. Or what you can essentially do is align the diffractive rings in such a way that the first and the 
first and the fourth Purkinje images are aligned, and that can be achieved by asking the patient to look at a fixation light on this surgical microscope. You can also align the IULs along the anatomical center of the capsule in line with the visual axis, and if nothing uh, is possible, the best is to use a monofocal lens. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anand. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Mike, please. Yeah. How uh, much it is really useful in uh, EDOFs? EDOFs in angle alpha and uh, kappa. No, no, I'm asking about the EDOF lenses for uh, angle alpha or angle kappa. Is it really useful? The good news is that now the modern multifocal, trifocal lenses and all which have come have a larger central optic zone. So because it's a larger central optic zone, you can even go up to an angle alpha of 0.8 uh, theoretically and still do well. So that is one thing. Yeah, but, but then again, many of them are coming with a larger uh, central zone. But unfortunately, the Hoya, if you see, it is much smaller than what we are having already. So we'll have to be a little careful about, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anand. Our next speaker is uh, none other than Dr. Krishna Prasad Kutlu, sir. Uh, he'll be speaking us, uh, he is giving us, uh, enlightening us on the topic of optical biometry, buying the ideal one and putting it to best use. Dr. Krishna Prasad, sir, is the medical director of Pras Prasad Netralia Group of Hospitals in Nudupi. He is organizing chairman, Karnataka State of Thalmic. Uh, he was the organized chairman for the of Karnataka of Thalmic Conference, and he is the honorary secretary of Karnataka of Thalmic Society. Thank Over you, to you Thank you, Dr. Shaji, for including me in such a wonderful uh, course. So, I will be talking about, uh, about the optical biometry, which is the best to buy. I don't have any financial interest regarding any of these products. So, coming to the introduction, uh, the uh, biometry is nothing but the measurement of ocular parameters giving rise to ideal intraocular lens power measurement. So, if you make mistakes, for example, if you make around 1 mm of axial length mistake when you are doing with the ultrasound biometry, always there is a difference of around 2.7 diopters. And if you make a mistake even with the 1 mm of ECD, that means almost like a 1.5 adapters of IOL power difference will be there. So you have to be very careful when you are doing with the conventional ultrasound bio, uh, biometry, especially when you are uh, putting the probe on the cornea, you cannot press also. So uh, this has become like, uh, if you see a lot of studies, the most of the claims regarding the biometric errors only. So now this all this problem has been eliminated by the optical biometer because of its uh, high repeatability and reproducibility and also very easy to do and it gives a faster accurate reading. So these are the different biometers available in the market. Uh, the, you are having a of 500, 700. Alcon has come up with something called Argos and uh, there is one more biometry Tomi which is quite popular in the market. So coming to the IOL master 500, basically it works on the partial coherence inferometry, simplest of the uh, devices and good penetration only in early nuclear sclerosis around 93 percent. It takes around 60 seconds for both the measurement, but the one the problem what we noticed, patient with a slight PSC or even with a mature cataract, it's uh, impossible to do with this. Then we have along with that Lenstar also was there introduced by the Hackstreet company. But this works on the low coherence reflectometry based on the STOCT technology. Uh, the compared to the IOL Master 500, the only the scanning rate is slightly slower. Uh, but compared to uh, other OCDs, the penetration is slightly poor. But uh, the one advantage, it can be even integrated with the other Hackstreet devices. So coming to the IOL Master 700, which is based on the swift source OCT, good penetration even in the denser cataract, almost 99%. And for both the, it takes around 45 seconds to measure. The most important advantage with this 700 is total keratometry. It also gives the Barrett True K formula for even post-classic patient. I think Chitra Madam is going to talk about that. 
So, this is what I am just mentioning about. If your patient is having a white intumescent cataract, if they want to go for a premium surgery, still IOL Masters 700 can take out. And also, it even measures about the lens thickness also. So, um, along with that, the other features are, it takes about a central corneal topography that helps in uh, deciding the uh, IOL also. And also, it measures from like a corneal to retina scan, that uh, imaging technology. It also, very importantly, it detects the decentration and even tilt of the crystalline lens and even post-operatively intraocular lens also. These are the other advantage. Actually, uh, it visually verifies the evaluation by correlating the measurement of calipers with the image of anatomical structures of that eliminates the complex interpretation of a scan and reduces the potential source of error. So, the, the overall length it measures. So, basically it works on seven parameters. That is, it looks at the axial length, it looks at the corneal radius, corneal radius and looks at the antechamber depth. And angle kappa, this is very, very important. What they say that it is like a Chang wearing cord, the, the measurement what they say like that. And also it works on the lens thickness, central corneal thickness and white to white. So what uh, just the previous discussion, even angle kappa uh, more than 0 0.6, they, they say that uh, the chances of glare and halos are more with the multifocal intraocular lens. That is especially diffractive lenses. Coming, the, these are the other uh, advantages. Always you should, uh, a few refractive surprise especially you should look for always a good foveal pit and good fixation. This is a few example, if you see that this, this is the exact good fixation and good foveal pit. When you see like this, see there is, if you see the measurement, one line measurement to there, there is only 10 micron difference. That means this is the proper measurement. But if you see like this, and also when you look at the keratometry, there is not much difference in the measurement 1 and measurement 2. That is means only 0 0.02 diopter difference in the both the keratometry. That means you sh should look at both the measurement that there should not be any difference. Suppose for example, if you see like this, there is a poor fixation. You, the, because you cannot see the mm, foveal pit. Then if you see there is more than measurement 1 to measurement 2, you can see more than 190 micron difference. That means you have done the, your second measurement is not good. And also you should look for even keratometry difference of more than 0.5 diopter. That means you need to repeat the reading. Otherwise, you may land with the difference in the IOL power. And also you should look at the both die if there is a difference in the IOL power also. So, the, the also especially the other advantage, it also help in uh, look at the macula also, especially patients with uh, BRVO, so that you can refer them to the retina. And it can also take into all the four formulas like Holiday 1, Hoffer Q, SRKT, Hagis, Holiday 2 and Barrett 4. So all four generation formulas are also it can take out. So nowadays even with the newer model, I think you need not have to bother about go into the, their calculator. With the IOL Master 700 printout only, you can take out the where exactly you have to put the lens. But uh, as I said that it's a soft source biometry. You may have sometimes refractive surprise and optical. There is one minute time is there, no? Okay, I'll just finish. So apart from that, it can even uh, helpful, especially there are a lot of centers, including mine, that uh, it can incorporate into the Callisto also. The coming to the Tommy, uh, that also works on the SSOCT 3D tracking system. Placido disk topography has been incorporated. Good penetration even compared to the. Uh, IOL Master 700 and it takes just 45 seconds for both the measurement you can see in the picture so fast it is then coming these are the advantage even with the mortgage cataract also the study shows that Tommy UOA 2000 can take the readings so coming to the Argos which is the recent one which is similar to the IOL Master 700 but they say that it is faster than the uh, all other biometers in the market. So it also takes angle to angle and corner to retina OCT images and it has got a toric IOL calculator and it can be also integrated into a digital microscope aura and uh, this one. So I will not talk about lens star. So the one more uh, biometer I just want to tell about the anterior which has got including topography and everything. So in the end I just want to tell what to buy. So if you are if you want cost effective, good toric calculator to me holds good because of the price factor. If you want a gold standard biometry integration with the Merkel-less toric element, go for IOL Master 700, that is the best. Then still if you want to go for higher end biometer with the serial documentation in astigmatism, I think Argos gives the best result. Then 
probably if you need a good biometer with the multimodal imaging functions like topography and all of the features then anterior and gives the good result so choose the biometer on the basis of the requirement and available of the cost of the investment higher end machine for future purpose like markerless toric alignment system consider after sales service also very very important presence or absence of other investigation like aso ct or ability you need to look at and consider return of investment based on your consultation fee and particular investment once again i thank my brother saji and the whole team of ks for this opportunity thank you one and all thank you sir wonderful talk as usual uh, any doubts to dr krishna prasad sir on the biometry evaluation okay sir thank, thank you. you sir thank you next uh, i would like to call dr shaji who is our chief instructor to present about uh, biometry in challenging situation uh, is the cornea facial refractive surgeon working in abeta hospital pendavana okay good morning everyone uh, so uh, we are in an area wherein the litigations against uh, uh, faco surgeons are increasing why because the faco surgery is now considered as a equivalent to refractive surgery so the patient's expectations are more and here the main culprit is usually the biometric evaluation so we have to make sure ensure that our biometric platforms are on a stronger basis all the time and it's even more challenging when the when the situations are more difficult to deal with so the few difficult situations i have kept in mind is when you have a poor corneal or ocular surface when you have a uh, to do a biometry post refractive surgery the detail would be given by dr chitra madam and when you have a toric iol calculation when you have biometry in irregular corneas when you have to do biometry in post penetrating keratoplasty when you have to do biometry in dense cataracts when you have to do biometry post retinal surgeries and of course biometry is in high myopes and hypermetropes so to begin with when you have to think about when you are seeing a poor cornea or a bad ocular surface we always have to keep a history of whether the patient has been using contact lenses so if the patient is on soft contact lenses we have to ensure that they have removed the soft contact lenses uh, for the past 3 days if the patient is having rigid contact lenses it should be removed for at least 3 weeks and if it's toric it has to be removed at least 1 week prior and if the patient is having mebumen gland dysfunction bad dry eye or sp case make sure this is treated first and then biometry is being advised so the next uh, the detail would be dealt with dr chitra madam so here the main things we have to keep in mind is the alterations in the corneal curvature we know it can uh, result in one diopter with a small error and the effective lens position calculation is usually wrong and we usually underestimate the myopic and uh, myopic patient usually land up uh, post op uh, retinal surgery biometry they become hyperopic so the instrument error is one thing to deal with because it is the 3 mm zone even the central area is at different curvatures and the next thing is uh, the relationship of refractive index of 1.337 after altering the corneal curvature or making it flatter is no longer standing so most of the iol formulas of uh, calculating at 1.337 again gives us error so here we have lot of formulas to deal with and it is mainly the ho holiday ekr that is gaining important equivalent k reading to get a good k uh, it is calculating and the highlight here is we keep or calculate it at 4.5 mm and we take the ekr mean of 65 to get a good k value for the formulas and the formula error usually as i said the effective lens position is uh, have wrongly placed to be more anterior and again the patient would land up uh, in a hyperopic mode and uh, easy way out would be to take up the uh, ascrs calculator and uh, get the uh, power out the next thing is again the toric iol calculation so here it is we know we have lot of uh, iol calculators that is available online one thing to be highlighted here is we have to take care about the posterior curvature of the cornea and that has to be recorded otherwise uh, we may land up with a wrong biometric value and if it is calculated to be a with the rule is missed then the patient 
uh, would land up uh, in uh, over refraction and if it's against the role is missed the patient may land up in an under correction and the next thing uh, we keep in mind is how uh, the about the biometry in irregular corneas so as i said the relationship of between the anterior curvature and posterior curvature is important the formulas would work out well but when that relationship altered is altered in irregular corneas uh, then uh, that is no longer standing and we may land up with a wrong biometric uh, value so here uh, we uh, by the learning the topography for every cataract surgeon is important and we should not miss a case of keratoconus or a case of pellucid marginal degeneration a case of post lasic ectasia or a decentered ablations and uh, if you have a very bad irregular cornea uh, it's always recommended to go about and uh, take three readings um, make sure uh, we are looking at a uh, irregular area and then we can uh, now since the refractive surgery have developed much we can first smoothen up the cornea by topo guided customized ablation and then go about and do a, a good biometry and uh, get a good result the next thing is in penetrating keratoplasty again uh, sorry in penetrating keratoplasty we know uh, we usually land up with high cylindrical values in uh, post keratoplasty cases and uh, here the idea now is in the toric iols give us a maximum of minus 6 but now if it is more than 14 we actually have the uh, freedom of customizing the uh, I, uh, intraocular lenses and the next is in cases of hard cataract we know the calculations of axial length is usually important and uh here uh, the main thing is uh, the errors occur in calculating the axial lengths and we have to uh, make sure that uh, we are using uh, we are not using the older methods and we may have to go about and do a, the latest uh, uh, optical biometers or also uh, take up the ultrasonic uh, immersion techniques to get a good axial length and when taking the measurements we have to make sure that we are checking the standard deviations from the optical biometers and the sound noise ratios also and we should not take deviations that is more than 0.2 diopters or a sound noise ratio of less than 2 is not taken up and the next is in post retinal surgeries uh, we have uh, to be sure make we have to make sure that uh, the uh, iol calculation while doing the iol calculation we have to in silicon oil as well as in vitrectomized eyes uh we have to take care of the axial length and we can take it as 2/3 and also in uh, when you there are also techniques of uh, calculating it in trop and in high myopes in high myopes uh, while doing the biometry we have to uh, take care of there are a lot of formulas that is being available and we usually take care uh, use the barrett struke we have the uh, uh, holiday system and we uh, also have the rbf hill uh, to calculate the iol powers and in hypermetropes the hagis and hofer q uh, gives us good results and also make sure about the asphericity of the cornea because in prolate corneas we can land up in myopic also take care of uh, take care of the high order abrasions of the cornea with that i thank you all for your patient listening Uh, our next speaker is none other than dr chitra ramamurthy murthy uh, she will be speaking about biometry in uh, post refractive surgery a uh, very good morning to one and all of you and thank you very much dr shaji for this uh, invite to be included in your course so biometry is actually uh, in a, a complex topic and post refractive surgery makes it that little more complex because the challenge here is that these patients have enjoyed that visual independence before the uh, before when they got the refractive procedure and would want similar and would be even be ready for enhancements if they are stuck somewhere so essentially we all know that today the way the cataract surgery stands it's not just rehabilitative but it's also a refractive procedure wherein more than 80% of the patients are actually within plus minus 0.5 and 98% of them are within plus minus 1 diopters of target refraction 
if there has been no refractive surgery done. But the outcomes become challenged if there has been a refractive surgery done and you come for a cataract surgery. Now, what is the challenge? Why is it that the IOL power calculation is so difficult after refractive surgery? And the next question comes, what is the accurate way of calculating the IOL power? So the essential reasons for residual post-op errors is axial length measurements and we have now standing at this uh, stage where it's an unsurpassed accuracy with the different optical biometers which we have. So the other challenge is the characterometric errors. When we talk of characterometric errors, it could be a characterometric index error, an instrument error or an extrapolation of ELP. Now, characterometric error, like if we if the feed in the radius uh, of curvature, it has to be converted to the power in diopters, and it, this is the formula which is being used, where n, which is the refractive index, is a fictitious value of 1.3375, which was arrived at so that an average i of 45 diopters, the, uh, the radius is equal to the power. But it also assumed that the ratio of the anterior to the posterior curvature is 82%. Now, all of this gets altered in a refractive surgery, which is a point to note. Now, all the earlier calculations of IOL power was based on the surmise that the cornea was a spherical cornea. Whereas in post-classic, myopic classic, it becomes a little oblate. In a hyperopic classic, it becomes... A hyperprolate and in post RK the central cornea gets flatter. The other error is the instrument error. What happens is whether we are using a manual K at 3.2 or you are using an IOL master with three rings or your uh, uh, lens star, what happens is that you are not able to measure the most central part of the cornea. So all the measurements are paracentral and you are assuming on the central value. So what happens in a myope, the paracetal cornea is actually a little steeper than the central cornea which is very flat. So you end up overestimating the K and underestimating the IOL power and you end up with a hyperopic surprise. The other issue is the problem of the extrapolation of ELP. Now based on the Fyodorov's concept, the ELP was measured based on the curvature K of the cornea and the height and the corneal diameter. Height is distance from the corneal surface to the implant center. Now, if the IOL is placed a little in front, it needs a lesser power. If the IOL is sitting a little behind in the capsular bag, it needs a higher power. So that much difference comes if the effective lens position is not accurately measured. However, the Arambari's double K method and the other new, uh, newer methods which have come in, like Hague cell formula, they do not rely on the K by pre op K, but they rely, and in Hague's especially, uses the anterior chamber depth to arrive at the ELB. So there have been modifications with the newer generation formulas. So what the next question comes, what is the solution which you are going to offer? This by estimating the corneal power, either with a total characterometry or the Pentacam EKR or the Galileys. So in total characterometry, using a toric model to measure the anterior corneal surface and with the help of the swept source OCT and B scan, you are inter extrapolating the same uh, points on the posterior cornea and getting a total TK. But we also need to remember that in all those uh, uh, calculations, Hoffer, Q, Holiday and everywhere, they have derived a mathematical matter, uh, method of estimating or assuming the posterior corneal astigmatism. And if you add this total TK to that, you could end up with an overcorrection. The other one is the Pentacam EKR value where it gives us the K value at different optical zones. Again, it can be used in those formulas which use the holiday report. It can't be used in double K Arambari's uh, formula or it can't be used in Hague's which have used a different methodology of measuring the K value. And then is the Galilee's which is a ray tracing method which is takes it to a different level of accuracy. So the solutions are then not using formulas that extrapolate K. So then you could look at the uh, ASCRS calculator wherein one, 
you know the pre op k but you either you have the surgical induced change uh, known or it's not available and based on that the different choices are coming because of the limitation i'm not going into the specifics however again at this point of time the hage cell uses a corrected corneal index so what it does is that is what is incorporated in its formula and it is not relying on the corneal curvature at all to and so there is no way it is going to extrapolate the elp the acrs calculator earlier had the pre op uh, corneal details and the refractive change and then only with the refractive change where there was no prior data but it was seen that in less than 60% of the cases only you were within plus minus 0.5 diopters and then the what it used to give was an average value and what would be the least or the max value and you needed to use decide that you can overestimate k in a myope so use the lowest value you can underestimate k in a hypero so use a higher value but then the recent asrs calculator has done away with the group 1 it only has group 2 and group 3 and definitely goes without saying that the ocd derived formulas are way ahead So in the ACRS calculator, you can go into prior myopic, prior hyperopic, prior K values, and feed in all the datas, and then it gives you the minimum and max. You can do it similarly for the hyperop, and it will give you the minimum and max. Whereas in Barrett True K, the specific thing it is using a mod mathematical model which is not. like told to us where it calculates a modified k and it also uses a double k solution that is it uses a pre op k uh, of the prior refractive surgery and uses the post op k and then thus it makes its calculation in the virgins formulas so here in again you need to feed in the lasik mode need to enter all the details which are asked and it is seen in abu lafia's study that the barrett seems to be doing extremely well within plus minus 0.5 one diopter and two diopter of predicted accuracy and again literature also says that where well, the hagi cell the hill rbf and the barrett's are doing well in more than 90% of the cases a word about radial keratomotomy is we know that the vision is fluctuation because of the diagonal variation refraction and the progressive hyperopic shift we also know that you think that the cornea is flat and you underestimate inaccurately estimate the elp to be a little forward which is not so we also know we need to measure right in the center of the cornea in a radial keratotomy which is not possible so the iol bar calculation what they do is if it is you add half a diopter if there are four incisions add one to 1.5 there are eight incisions and at two diopters if there are 12 or more incision and again in acrs calculator you can do the post rk calculation but be prepared that you will need for the eye to stabilize till the transient hyperopia goes post smile is much more better much better because of more favorable keratometric and abrometric values and even the ekr value shows a good peak so are the abrometric uh, aberrations uh, study which shows the last slide which i have to tell you is so in post rk you can use a true k toric for a myopic classic we remember that you are inducing positive spherical aberration so you use a negative spherical aberration iol and most of our iols are negative spherical aberrations for a hyperopic classic we need to remember that you are inducing negative aberration so use a positive spherical aberration like a sensar 3 piece iol or an aberration free iol of bosch and lom and if it is an irregular aberration use use an aberration free lens so in conclusion what i would like to say is we need to conceptualize that there's a error going to happen in k value in keratometric measurements in elp we need to remember that we need to use the solutions or the latest formula which have taken us given as an alternate approach and if you thoroughly understand the science behind biometry we would be able to do still well with all our post refractive surgery patients who come for a cataract surgery thank you very much thank you ma'am uh, wonderful enlightening talk uh, any doubts uh, regarding this presentation okay ma'am thank you our next speaker is dr santra ganesh uh, she'll be enlightening us on the topic of biometry in children dr santra is a senior consultant and of pediatric ophthalmology in strabismus at aravindai hospital coimbatore uh, she has 15 years of experience in this field and she has around 30 publications as first order and uh, she has special interest in complex strabismus myopia amblyopia and thank you over to you ma'am 
Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shahji, for your kind invitation. And uh, thanks to all the speakers before me who did a wonderful job and I had a lot of learning here. So I'm going to talk about a, a different situation as well, which is biometry in children. Um, modern pediatric cataract surgery involves timely restoration of the visual axis. Uh, you should appropriately investigate, ensure a proper general anesthesia, and also age-appropriate post-operative refraction is mandatory. So if you see children like these, you know that you are seeing looking at total cataracts and we need to operate as soon as possible. We cannot keep waiting until we get a good biometry. But usually up to the age of one, uh, we do not place an IUL. That is the generally agreed consensus. But we do operate. So for dense bilateral cataracts, the window is around four to six weeks of age. Before about the age of four weeks, there is a high risk of AFK glaucoma and beyond six weeks, it's going to compromise the visual outcome. So initially, we give glasses or contact lenses. And these slides, you look at the partial cataracts where it is uh, younger or older, we can uh, wait till we get good readings. And uh, the indication for surgery in partial cataract, in verbal children, you are lo uh, looking at like a Snell lens equity of less than 6, 9 and 8. Whereas in pre-verbal, you base it on the uh, visual uh, behavior of the child. And the surgeon should always decide whether the blur created by the partial cataract justifies eliminating the natural mechanisms of emetopization and accommodation. So bilateral cataract is around one year, uh, roughly. Corneal diameter should always be more than 10. And also, you should ensure that there is an uneventful surgery with in-the-bag implantation. Minimum age for bilateral, as I said, by around one year. Unilateral, you can decide to uh, place an IOL earlier on, provided the other parameters are normal. But why do we think so much about IOL implantation? Because there are possibilities of huge errors in power calculation. The surgery as such is very simple. You can place an IOL. But the problem is in uh, the ca calculation and the lens power uh, uh, determination. Because most of like in smaller eyes, the actual length will be less than 20, age less than 36 months, where there is a chance of getting errors. So when that uh, you have decided to operate, what next? So you should be looking at what is the ideal IOL power to be uh, uh, chosen, what is the formula, actual length, care reading, all has to be uh, calculated, and uh, there are a lot of clinical variables also. But what are the challenges when it comes to children? One is the measurements, because in younger children, you may not be able to get a measurement uh, in the wake state. You have to rely on measurements under general anesthesia, which may not be entirely accurate. All the formulas are based on adult so there is no formula which has been developed for children, IOL material, and there's a growing eye. The target refraction is not emetropic as in adults. Uh, we have undercorrecting the child because of, uh, otherwise there will be a myopic shift later on. So these are the factors just to enu uh, enumerate. What are the factors causing inaccuracy in pediatric IOL power calculation? Is your actual length and care reading measurement errors? Uncooperating uh, during the examination, fixation error. During anesthesia, you're not going to get any fixation. And the supine posture, which is used for measurements, that itself can create an error. The, all the instruments are designed for adult eyes. Different biometry and anatomical differences from adults using adult formulae. And uh, PPC and anterior vitrectomy can affect the effective lens position and target refraction and growing myopic shift. So these are all the errors which can happen. So at birth, the mean actual length is very small. It's only around 17 millimeters, and it grows very rapidly to around 21 millimeters at one year of age. There is almost a four millimeter change. That is why it is not ideal to place an eye wheel in the less than one year age group in bilateral eyes. At 10 to 15 years, it comes to around the adult size. Similarly, the K reading at birth is around very steep, around 50, um, like, and it changes very rapidly in the first six months of age. Again, so if you are going to place an IOL, there's a huge chance of error there. So the measurements needed, uh, like we said, uh, to measure the actual length, you can use optical or ultrasound based on the age of the child. Again, in ultrasound, it can be contact or immersion-based methods. So ultrasound uh, biometry we are mostly using in smaller children when we need to measure under anesthesia, where the errors are more likely when the eyeball is less than 20 millimeters long, because a small compression can result in an error of like two point, around 2 to 3 diopters error can come. So when you uh, compare contact versus immersion, so this is an examination and anesthesia which we uh, perform just before uh, the child is going to be operated on or you can schedule it on an earlier day. Um, the, there should not be any eyelid speculum and it should just be just after the induction. 
and uh, if you are using the contact technique you should be really sure because a small compression can result in a huge error so now we have moved to immersion we no longer do the contact biometry in small children the only thing is sometimes in very small children the immersion cup doesn't fit very well so uh, in that situation rare situation we use the um, uh, contact method so immersion method is definitely much more accurate in fact we have a postgraduate thesis going on and uh, when we compare between the two the immersion gives uh, better values so coming to the measurement of keratometry again you can see that this is a handled uh, keratometry device which is being used again values are being recorded just before uh, the child is going to be operated on and with these instruments it's very uh, easy to get uh, reliable measurements so those are in children like usually less than 2 or 3 years old in older children we can get good optical biometry values if they are able to sit uh, on the iol master 700 we uh, that is our preference of choice but here again after calculating the iol power uh, what equation to use right now in our center we are using the barrett's two formula before that we were using the srkt formula i would say these and in very small eyes hofer q also gives good results but uh, how to under correct this is extremely important um wilson and trivedi's uh, table is the most accurate table as of now and you have to look at the target refraction which is given for each uh, month uh, like uh, like 6 to 12 months is around plus 7 for a unilateral cataract is around plus 5 for a bilateral cataract so you have to enter the target refraction and then look at the eye hole power and that will help to uh, emetropize the eye as it grows otherwise if you are going to aim for emetropia you are looking at a myopic shift of minus 7 or minus 8 as the child grows so uh, the status of the fellow eye also should be taken into consideration if there is a large uh, degree of anisometropia that also you should take into consideration it is always a fine balance between um, amblopia and preventing myopic shift so if you are going to target for only myopic shift then you may be looking at like plus 7 or plus 8 in the immediate post op and that can cause amblopia so take note of eyes that are very short or very long axial length errors are more significant in short eyes and in a long eye there may be a posterior staphyloma so you always um, look for that and uh, always uh, if there is a repeat difference between the two eyes you have to repeat because uh, again that can be a source of error also repeat if there is a difference in keratometry between the two eyes and always look back at your results and that's when uh, if you audit your own results there are cases where we have looked at huge refractive surprise and uh, we should go back and look at what are the reasons for the above so that we can better our techniques thank you thank you dr santra uh, wonderful talk uh, any uh, doubts with regard to biometry in children uh, we are running short of time uh, thank you santra our next speaker is uh, dr rishad uh, he is a cornea refractive surgeon at malabar medical college over to you thank you dr shadi for including me in this ic Good morning. So I'm going to present about immersion biometry getting perfect results. So in this era, we are most of the surgeons in government hospitals or who does not have availability of uh, any optical biometer. We constantly you have to use an ultrasound biometer. So in ultrasound biometer, the most important thing is training your technical staff. So you have to spend a lot of time in this training, and you have to modify this training accordingly. about immersion technique the spike pattern interpretation the correlation of this measurement in myopic and hypermetropic patients and check for the inner eye differences and there should be an ergonomically designed room for this uh, immersion biometry because patient has to lie down technician has to do with that position and at the same time technician has to see the monitor also so a room and a well qualified technician is very important thing second one you have you should have a technician who is constantly doing biometry for all patients so if there so many technicians and uh, fellows or pgs that's actually not good for this uh, biometry so how does this uh, biometry works because it's a thin focus sound beam that reflect in the interface interface means area of different refractive index so in contact eye scan the main problem is the corneal compression this corneal compression can leads to a different and ac depth in different scan that leads to a change in the um, axial length 
that also can lead to coronal aberration and poor repeatability. So we always try to do immersion for all of our patients. So in this case, we are using a shell that is filled with uh, distilled water or saline, and we look for the waves. So there should be a double-peaked echo on the cornea that showing the anterior and posterior surface of the cornea. Uh, there can be uh, the anterior led wave echo from the anterior lens capsule, echo from the posterior lens capsule, and retinal waves. This retinal echo should be sharp 90 degree from the baseline. This is very important. And there should be a scleral spikes and then orbital fat. So how do we know? It's perpendicular to the visual axis. As we discussed, there should be all these five or six spikes. And if you see the fourth spike, it should be exactly 90 degree from the baseline. In the second picture, you can see the retinal spike is not perpendicular. And in that picture, you have to repeat the scan. And whenever there is the two, you look on the uh, lens spikes, there should be equal lens spikes from the anterior and posterior uh, capsule. So if it is different, that means that it is not well aligned. So there should be a 90 degree from the baseline, the retinal spikes, anterior and posterior lens spike should be in similar length. If it is focused towards the optic nerve, there will be missing scleral spikes. So in this picture, you can see after the retina, you can see only the orbital fat. There is no retinal spikes. So that means it is directed towards the optic nerve. So this gives a false value. And you have to optimize the gain. So what is gain? It is the amplification of the echoes on the display screen. If gain is very low, you get very small spikes. If it is very high, you lose resolution. So what is resolution? It is the, uh, uh, you have to use minimum gain that gives a good resolution. That means you can clearly identify the retinal and scleral spikes. In pseudophagics, you have to check for the IOLs because the velocity in different IOL varies. You have to, uh, if you are doing a, comparing the eye with a pseudophagy patient, you have to carefully select the type of IOL used in the calculation. So formula of choice, nowadays we use Barrett's online calculation for all patients. Ideally, in shorter axial length, you can use Hoffer Q, and longer axial length, you can use SRKT. So, but it does not include the effective lens position because it is not included in the AC depth and length thickness. So in all patients, we use uh, a CRS calculation, online calculation, either by a mobile or a laptop. You can just enter the value and you can enter the AC depth and lens thickness. That gives a better result in all patients. So by doing this, we have achieved more than 80% of the paper, uh, patients getting uh, almost uh, within 0.5 adapter value. So nutshell, you should have a trained staff who is doing biometry in all patients, positioning of the patient, a well-aligned probe, appropriate gain, and a proper formula gives the best results. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rishad. Wonderful talk. Uh, any doubts with regard to the current topic of immersion biometry? Uh, if not, uh, I think the next uh, session speakers are already here. We just have five more minutes for any topics of discussion we had in this session. Okay, thank you all.